I'm going to take you through the game between Bobby Fischer and Jorge Rubinetti from the Interzonal Tournament 1970. And this game was an absolute massacre. Remember, to subscribe to the channel, then do click on the button below. It's free, of course. And if you'd like to su support the channel, then do check out the links to PayPal or Patreon.com, and you'll find them in the video description. So we rejoin Fisher on the road to Reykjavik 1972, that incredible world championship match against Spassky. But to get to that, he had to qualify from the interzonal tournament, and uh, that would take him through to the candidates' matches and so on. But okay, the interzonal. With seven rounds to go, things were still in the balance. Fisher had lost to Larson, Geller was right up with him as well. Um, so he's facing Rubinetti here, and Fischer plays his pawn to e4, his favourite move, although he was already starting to experiment in this tournament. Uh, he played b3 against Mecking, for example. But we have an open Sicilian, and Fischer was highly experienced, not just with white, but with black, of course, yeah, from this position. And here Rubinetti played e6, so Scheveningen. And Fischer went for his favourite, bishop c4, and then a6. So we've transposed basically into a knight or variation. Fischer had uh, a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience with exactly this position. And, and this system with bishop c4 was, was one of his favourites against the knight off. Here the move that I like to play with black is knight d7. And the idea is that... The knight sits on c5, keeps the bishop um, in, its, in its vision. You can always exchange off it if things get too hot, and also protects the pawn on e6 from any sacrifices. But b5, of course, is the other normal move in this position. And I should say bishop e7 as well. Or knight c6. Lots of ways black can play this. But the way that Rubinetti plays is um, quite uncompromising, very sharp, because black is trying to set up an attack in the middle straight away, possibly pushing that pawn to b4. Of course, the disadvantage is that black has neglected his development on the king side, so king is still in the middle and also once his bishop moves away from e6 then sacrifices are now possible on e6 so this is a highly dangerous way for black to play bishop g5 so just developing and h6 well, you can actually take here uh, but bishop h4 and this is a real crossroads for black, and it's very easy to get it wrong. So, for example, if black simply attempts to reach safety on the king side with bishop b7, this is a well-known mistake in this kind of position, that here this sacrifice is very strong, because now that the g-pawn is unprotected, as the bishop has moved here, then the queen is attacked, the pawn is attacked. Once white gets three pawns for the piece uh, and has dislodged the king, displaced the king. Knight will bounce back here. This is very, very good for white. What else have we got? Um, queen b6 is possible. Then white can even consider just sacrificing a piece like this because black is not going to be able to castle on the king side. Castling on the queen side is also fraught with danger. So that is not a stupid sacrifice. Rubinetti played knight c5 here, which uh, has fatal consequences already. Uh, I mean, knight c5 in some ways is very understandable, uh, as I mentioned before, to guard e6 and also look at the bishop. But there's a problem with it. Um, interestingly, this position has actually to some extent been rehabilitated uh, by 
well, several players, but notably the uh, Russian grandmaster Semen Dvaris, who played uh, g5 here, and then knight e5. So what this does is basically shut the e-file. So that these sacrifices on d5 or f5, um, they're not going to be as powerful. We see this idea in the knight off very often, that the pawn comes to g5, protecting the f4 square, so that gives black a foothold in the middle of the board. Now, of course, this is very dangerous for black, but this is playable. It's interesting. But knight c5 played in this game. And here is Fischer's move, bishop d5. Now, this kind of thing has been seen before. I recall Tal playing similar sacrifices, not just Tal as well. And I suspect that Fischer has pro probably had this position uh, in hundreds of blitz games. Um, or And he would have analysed it as well. He knew this opening backwards, not just from the white side, but from the black side as well. So this is just meat and drink to him, actually. Bishop d5. Now, let's see. Um, I mean, one of the ideas is that this bishop, this knight can land on c6. So, for example, if bishop e7 here, then knight c6 is already looking pretty bad for black. I'm sure there are, there are other ways to play as well. Um, if, well, queen c8 was actually played in the game between Ribley and Sakei from 1969, even before this, and white just has a huge advantage here. Big initiative. Queen comes to h5, threatening knight e6. I mean, this is an absolutely dreadful position for black. What else we got? Uh, b4. You can take here and knight d5. Let's give this one up. And once the king is there, we can open up the position. The queen comes to a4, also tremendous for white. And you can see that you know this the rook and the bishop are just completely out of play. Rubinetti took the bishop. So bishop d5 has just been played. Discover check. And the problem is, of course, that if bishop e7, then simply knight f5 is going to win material back. So rook check, king staggered across to d7, but now that the king is in the middle, there's a clear target. And b4 attacks the knight, forces it to a4. So this is just a forced sequence for white. We can exchange and then play c4. Nice move, c4. Solid. Protects that pawn. Potentially starts a pawn storm and also opens up this diagonal for the queen. And, well, already white has two pawns for the piece. And I think we can say oh, this is just a winning position. Black's pieces are just dreadful. Those pieces are just completely cut in half. Here, uh, queen c2 is probably a better move, actually. Looking to push straight away, but Fischer played queen b3. And actually, black has a better chance of defending with h5. It's not completely clear. Um, but, I mean, white is doing well, but h5 represents the best chance to defend. But knight h5... I think it's an understandable move, wanting to exchange off this dark squared bishop. But white can break through straight away. Obviously, if bishop takes, then there's going to be a pin here, and that's just awful. Um, queen d5 was played now, and that loses immediately. Bishop d5 could be played, but then queen b6. Uh, 
and White's basic idea, well, of course, there, there are things like Rookie 8 in the air, um, but the, the basic idea is C6 here, just to open up the position, and that really does spell the end for the king, unsurprisingly, once the rooks get into the game. So, the game ended. Queen takes d5. Check. Queen a4. The king doesn't have a safe square to move to, so black has to block here. And that was the final move of the game. Obviously, if queen takes knight, then queen takes queen, and the rook can take the rook in the corner. Oh no, we can, can we do better than that? I think we can do better than that. Rook d1 check. Yeah, <laughs> that's more decisive if queen takes. And if king takes, we can give a check. And a check here. Let's, let's go all the way to checkmate. Queen c6, checkmate. Wow. So that was the final move of the game here. Black resigned. Well, what an absolute massacre. But as I said, you know, Fisher had probably had that in, in you know 20 blitz games. He knew this position backwards. So there we go. Uh, I'd like to show you more games actually from this interzonal tournament in 1970. Um, but let me say that this game started off a run of seven victories in a row. Fisher's last seven games, he won them all. And that took him way ahead in the tournament. So by the end, he had 18 and a half from the 23 games. 18 and a half. And Larson, Geller and Hubner were in equal second with 15 points. So Fisher had... A winning margin of three and a half points. That's when the world knew that Fisher was really, really meant business. Three and a half point margin of victory, having won his last seven games. And I want to show you another game from that sequence of seven victories. His game against Mark Taimanov, which I think was in a very different style. To this actually a more Fisher-esque style if I can say that you know this kind of massacre was a little bit unusual for Fisher actually I think of him as being a, you know a strategic player um, who didn't uh, often indulge in these kind of fireworks so let us know if you've got a favorite game of Fisher in this period the road to Reykjavik then do let me know and uh, do check out the Fisher playlist and the Spassky playlist if you want to see more of this kind of game.